anyone who loves Pushkin and his works, as I do, abominates, was the dashing young man who was attached to the French ambassador, to the French uh, embassy in St. Petersburg. Pushkin for many years, as I mentioned, had had many, many love affairs. And yet at a certain point, perhaps with his success or perhaps with his age, Pushkin decides he wishes to settle down. And having so many contacts and so many relationships in his past, he decides and picks one of the most beautiful young women, arguably the most admired young woman in all of St. Petersburg, Natalia Goncharova. And I just wanted to give you a couple of images of Natalia Goncharova, who looks rather like what Lizaveta in the story should have looked like. So who is Dantes? Dantes is a conventional figure. And the rumor is put round, people have repeatedly done this, the rumor is put round that uh, Natalia Gancharova is not being faithful to her new important husband, Pushkin. Cruel rumors are spread. And finally, Pushkin decides that this is unacceptable. What is the last straw for Pushkin? The specific accusation that this figure that you see here, Dantes, had seduced and was having an ongoing affair with his wife, Natalia Goncharova. Pushkin makes a decision, and you might think about the dual language that's in the short story. Pushkin makes a decision not to let this insult pass, and he challenges Dantes to an illegal activity, a duel. And the two of them meet on January 27th in 1837 early on a frosty cold morning in a sort of wonderful orchard as a group of trees that's just outside of the immediate downtown of St. Petersburg. There are many versions of the story, but I'll just tell you one. You may not know what an old school duel was like. An old school duel begins with something that we don't normally connect with a duel. It begins with a coin toss. So the seconds, the people who are backing both Pushkin and Dantes as they meet on that cold morning, one of them has to toss a coin. Why do you toss the coin? Well, for this reason, so boom, catch. You toss the coin and Pushkin is allowed to call out heads or tails. Same for Dantes. They call out heads, heads, tails, tails. The second lifts up his hand its tails. Pushkin wins the coin toss. What does he win? He wins the opportunity to shoot first. It's a pistol duel. So the two of them pace off in opposite directions. They both turn and Pushkin, knowing Dantes is an extremely good marksman, better marksman, better uh, accuracy uh, uh, as someone with guns than Pushkin, Pushkin has the first shot and he can aim it straight at Dantes's chest. Instead, at least according to people who are witnessing this illegal duel, what Pushkin does instead is to shoot in the air. He wastes his bullet. So the next shot goes to Dantes. And what does Dantes do? Well, of course, he's an excellent marksman. He lines up his gun specifically to be able to shoot Pushkin. And what does Pushkin do? Well, there's some pretty good things you could do having wasted his shot that would at least minimize your injuries. An obvious one is this to turn your side to the gun so that you have bones rather than organs. Forgive me if this is uh, disturbing, it's a disturbing story. You have bones which would hit the bullet and you'd be injured, it would be painful, but you might well survive. According to people around, what Pushkin does is quite the opposite. As Dantes lowers his gun, Pushkin turns his chest full on. He shot in the stomach and spends three days dying agonizingly in St. Petersburg as all of the great people in the town come to visit him. This is our UT undergraduates visiting the location of the duel in this lovely uh, park with all these great trees. Pushkin laid out in state and the memorial, Miesta Dueli a es Pushkina. So Petersburg is a strange place where an African poet can succeed and marry the most beautiful woman in the world but squander his chance to win a duel and end up dying before the age of 38. 
it's populated with people. I wanted you to have the Pushkin story, this intense romantic identity. Many people suggest that Pushkin wanted to die young. People have suggested he wanted to die like the poet he most admired from the English tradition, George Gordon, Lord Byron. But I wanted just to give you a montage of portraits from the period as how you might wish to imagine the characters. Arest Kiprensky here is portraiting himself in the style of a European avant-garde, trendy bohemian artist. Here, Kiprensky is presenting himself and his clothing says it all very much in the style of being a real Russian in every way. Karl Bryalov is the other portrait artist who's so fashionable and important in the earlier 19th century. And here he represents himself as a kind of work in progress. The unfinished portrait captures perhaps the kind of suffering and uneasiness that we watch German go through. I wanna use just two portraits to make a point about the society of St. Petersburg. Here Kaprensky is giving us the image of a middle-class, highly successful man and his family by the edge of the lake, and you can see the wife and child in the background. So again, images to keep in mind is what Pushkin's characters would look like, but I'm actually gonna focus on the name, Albrecht. I don't know whether Russian rings in your ears all the time, but Albrecht is not a Russian name. Albrecht is a German name. Like German, St. Petersburg is filled with people who are at home and not at home from Petersburg, but their families are from North Africa, from Germany, from France, maybe from the realm of the supernatural. I wanted to give you this image of another beautiful young woman. You already have Goncharova, and this is Ryumina. She was a singer and an actress. Again, to imagine the kind of presentation that Lizaveta would have had as she went to all the fashionable parties, wondering whether an engineer was really too low ranking to be her proposed spouse. I'm using this image as an amazing one by Brilov again called Sadnitsa, the female person who's riding. It's an incredibly complicated and interesting image because of the terror on the horse's mouth and the way the dog is uneasy at the bottom. But again, what I want to do is use the names. These two girls, these two young women, are the adopted daughter of someone called Samailova. And you know it from the first moment. Giovannina and Amacilia Pacini are certainly not going to be the same family as Samoylova. These are like the Countess's decision to adopt Lizaveta, families that are, to use a modern word, blended, where parents are not matched with children, where children get matched with, going back to the Death Cab song, with children get matched with potentials to make money and to achieve position. I want to give you a sense of what St. Petersburg looked like in the period. This is a wonderful scene. It's an amazing film. If you're sort of a film buff, you should have the, uh, take the opportunity to see it. It's called Russian Ark, and it was done a number of years ago. And what's so striking about it is that the director decided to do this film in three unedited, unbroken shots. So it's shot in that palace you saw on the square with all the lights and so forth a little while ago. It's shot in the interior of that palace. And when the film was made, he did three takes, again, no cuts, no edits, and he picked his favorite one. And so I'm showing you the very ending of the film. Uh, it, it's more um, sort of impressionistic, so it doesn't ruin the story. No spoiler alert here at all. But I want you to see the spaces of Imperial St. Petersburg. Again, nothing is being done with a filter. Nothing has been doing with with cuts and you'll actually get a chance because of it being the last scene to see Pushkin and his um, wife um, Gancharova on the staircase within the winter palace now called the Hermitage. Here's a little bit of Russian arc. Thank you. 
Как жалко, что вас нет рядом. Вы бы все поняли. Смотрите. Море вокруг. И плыть нам вечно. И жить нам вечно. 